What's up guys, it's Mel with Treasuring Life and today I'm going to be talking about a book called The Secret, A Treasure Hunt. Now this book was written back in the 1980s by a man named Byron Price and it is an actual treasure hunt. So I'm going to tell you all about it, stay tuned. Let's get to what you're here for. We're going to be talking about a book called The Secret. As I said before, it was written back in the 1980s and it's an actual treasure hunt. Now, in the book, you'll find some very useful information in the first few chapters. You're going to use that in combination with the other parts of the book, which is the paintings and the verses. Now, all in all, there's 12 paintings and 12 verses, and you're supposed to match up one painting with one verse in order to find the clues that would lead you to an actual treasure location. Those 12 treasures are hidden all across North America, ranging from San Francisco, California to New York in Manhattan. And then there's supposed to be one in Montreal, Canada. Don't know yet, haven't done the research on that one. The jury's still out on that. To date, only two of these 12 treasures have been found. The first treasure was found in Grant Park in Chicago, Illinois in 1983. And that was using image number five and verse number 12. And then the second treasure was found in Greek Cultural Gardens in Cleveland, Ohio in 2004. And that was using image four, verse four. So we still have 10 remaining treasures that left to be found. Okay, now I was gonna go over all of this in one video, but I realized pretty quick that it's not gonna work like that. I'm gonna have to break this up into different episodes. Otherwise, this would be a really long video. So this video right here is just gonna be like an introduction to the secret to kind of tell you about it. Some insight into what it actually is that I think the author is trying to convey. Now, I have not personally found a cask and recovered it. I believe I've found the location of four of the casks. However, I have not been able to recover it because of red tape. Now, I have contacted city officials, I've contacted the historic societies, I've contacted all kinds of places that I can think of to try and cut through the red tape so I can get permission to either metal detect, probe, or dig, and have yet to be successful. None of these places are budging. All of the places that these casks were hidden were like super, super historic. Like one of them is supposed to be in St. Augustine, which is, you know, like the first ever city in America. But in future episodes, I'll be going over the different elements that I have come up with that kind of make up a price code, which someone in a Facebook post kind of, you know, named it that. So I'm just going to run with that designation. It works well. So yes, I have discovered what I think to be a price code. Now this code is, I've used it on four of the treasures that I've looked for. I haven't looked for the remaining ones. I've only done extensive research on the four. The remaining ones I've done, you know, like a little bit of looking here and there, but I haven't done extensive research. Now the four that I'm talking about are the, the first one is the closest one to my location here in Central Florida and that is the St. Augustine cask. And then there's the Charleston cask, the Roanoke Island cask, and the New York cask. So all four of those, I feel like I have uncovered the clues and put them together the correct way to figure out where the location is of the actual cask. So anyway, I'll be going over those elements in different episodes to let you know what it is that I feel like Byron Price was trying to convey, not only in the verses, not only in the pictures, but also in the book. So he gave us a lot of clues in all three places, and you have to put them together in a specific way in order to figure out the clues that would lead you to the location of a cask. So before I get any more into the book, I'm going to give you a little bit of backstory on how we got into the secret. When I say we, I mean me and my teenage daughter, Elena. So from the time my kids were toddlers, we were out there living life to the fullest on the weekends, going to theme parks like Busch Gardens and SeaWorld, going to water parks like Adventure Island and Aquatica. You know, we were going to the beach. We were going all kinds of places. We did a tubing trip down Rainbow River. You know, we were always out there living life, basically. I had them every other weekend and their dad had them on the opposite weekend. So when I had them and it was my weekend and I didn't have to work, I did what I could to enjoy my time with my kids. Now, fast forward to March of 2016 when I got in a really bad car accident. It realistically should have killed me. I've got a lot of injuries because of that car accident. So for basically the next two years, I wallowed in pain and self-pity. 
and didn't really get out there. We stopped going places, you know, we stopped going to the beach, we stopped living is what it feels like. Didn't want to injure myself further, didn't want to cause myself more pain, you know, it just, I just, the wreck really affected me. Plus I was really scared to drive. But what I'm trying to tell you here is, you know, basically the backstory, we were really active, stopped being active for about two years, and then I was like, you know what? I'm gonna be in pain for the rest of my life because of this wreck. I'm gonna be in pain whether I sit at home and do nothing or whether I'm out there doing something. So I decided I was just not gonna let it stop me anymore. I just had to put my foot down and get back to living because I felt like I was not living. I was just stuck in a rut and I wanted to get out of it. So realistically, this, this book saved me. Whenever I found out about this book in January, it really, it pulled me out of my funk. It made me interested in something again. It made me want to get out there again. Now, on top of all that, I also have ADD. Yay me. That means I pretty much need to have something occupying my mind at all times. Even if I'm not physically active, I am mentally active. So I'm constantly doing puzzles. I'm, I'm always going to school for something whether it's just to learn a new skill or learn a trade. Like I've been a nurse for 13 years. I would love to be a geologist. That's one of my passions. That's what I'm, I'm truly interested in. But basically what this means for me is, you know, I've got to have something to do all the time. Now, when my dad told me about this book, after watching the Expedition Unknown episode with Josh Gates, he told me about it because he knew I needed something to keep my mind busy. He knew I was going stir crazy. I needed something to fill my time. I needed something to keep my mind occupied. So he told me about this book. So I ordered it and it came in and my daughter and I, we got to work. We, we got to work right away. So I ordered it thinking that, you know, it would be a good way to get my daughter off of her phone because she's constantly on it. And it would be a good thing for us to bond over something that we could do together. And it actually worked. We bonded really well. It took me six days to figure out a specific location for the treasure cask in St. Augustine. The very next day, Elena found the clue that would lead us to the Charleston cask. So within seven days, we had already figured out the location for two treasures. And using the elements that we did in those two treasures, I was able to figure out an actual way to figure out each puzzle on its own, but using a, like an algorithm, using a code. And doing that, that's why I'm telling you this now. I'm going to go over all of these things with you, tell you what it is that, you know, that I think that Byron's trying to convey so that we can get these treasures found. They've been sitting in the ground for 36 years. It's time to get them out. So let's work together. I'm going to tell you everything that I've figured out and hopefully you can use what I know to get yourself a treasure. That's also how we came up with the name Treasuring Life. It's kind of a double meaning for us. It's because we started all this out looking for an actual treasure with the secret. Uh, but then it kind of, after that second time we went to St. Augustine, we were on our way home, gotten told no again by city officials, gotten some shit on the website, the PB Works website about the secret. And I really just wanted to, you know, quit. I just wanted to quit. But Instead, we talked about it and we were like, you know what, this was really fun. Bonding over these experiences, you know, getting out there and trying to live again. I got over my fear of driving. It took a lot of counseling and therapy and help and everything. However, you know, being able to move through that and get to a point where I could actually drive as far away as St. Augustine was great. And once I got there, the rest of these trips have been, you know, like smooth sailing. Like I, I feel like I can get out there with no problem now. So anyway, not only did we, you know, do it with the secret treasure hunt, but, you know, we started living our, our lives again. We started treasuring the lives that we have. And I gotta go. I got, like, appointments the rest of the afternoon. So I'll be back. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, yeah. I didn't get back to you yesterday. Got some bad news at the doctor's office. Apparently I need to have neck surgery ASAP. So, uh those um so yeah uh good times so let's get back to where we were now getting to the place where one of the treasures are buried has proven quite difficult it's been 36 years since the treasures were buried only two of the treasures have been found so far byron price unfortunately lost his life in a very tragic car accident in 2005 taking the location of the remaining casks with him even though the people in the beginning used 
just the book and just their knowledge of their particular area. These are meant to be found using the resources we have, okay? We have things that they didn't have back in the 1980s. We have Google, we have Photoshop, we have the ability to change colors on things and everything else to try and bring things out in a way that we can see it better. Now when Price buried these treasures, he meant for it to be difficult, but I don't think he realized just how difficult he made it. And then add to the fact that there's been 36 years that's passed since he buried those treasures, a lot of things have changed since then. We have statues that have been moved, monuments that have been moved, we have construction, we have things like that, that and we also had Hurricane Katrina because there's supposed to be a cask located in New Orleans and we had Hurricane Katrina, you know, we have no idea whether that cask is actually still recoverable or not. So, you know, we have all of these things. We know it's difficult, but it's still, we, we had things that happened in the last 36 years that could make it even more difficult to find the casks. But don't let that get you down because, like I said, the resources are still there and everything is documented. Everything that was moved is documented or it should be documented. And, you know, we should be able to use that knowledge to put things together and figure out where everything is. And the only reason I'm telling you this is so that you do your own research. Make sure that you're finding out, you know, if there's a statue there now that's only been there for 15 years, you know, look into the history. What was there before? Did they do any construction? Did they, you know, disturb the ground? Did they have to pour concrete? Did they, you know, just whatever. Do your own research. Make sure that you're looking into history and the actual documents within the city, within the, the zoning and everything. And please, please, please try to get permission. Please don't try to dig up one of these casks. I'm having my own trouble with trying to, to get permission with the cities. However, going without permission and just digging in one of these places is just not advisable. I wanted to, I really wanted to, like I've been to St. Augustine seven times since January and I've also been to Charleston twice. I've got all my clues that I did before I even took a trip there, okay? And then once I figured out all my clues, I took a trip there, that initial one to St. Augustine, and I confirmed everything in that first visit. I got some crap on, you know, the website and everything, like I said, so I went back a second time and it just confirmed it even more for me. I was like, you know, I know this is it. I know that's the place. I did the same thing with Charleston. The first time I went, I was pretty sure, but I was actually wrong the first time. The second time I went back, I knew exactly what I was looking for. The first time I thought I could just get on site and you know, figure it out from there because you would have visual clues that would really help you figure it out. But the visual clues that I thought I was lining up right actually were not right at all. They were close, but not right. So when I went back the second time in Charleston, I actually brought the things that I needed to. I figured out the clues and the actual location, but like I said, I was not able to get permission with them. So I'm gonna wait until I get permission to try to dig that one. Now these puzzles, yes, they are difficult, are very specific and intricate, yet also very vague and non-specific. So you, know, you have to put the clues together in a certain way and that's what all of this is about. So I'm gonna be going over all of this with you. I'm gonna go through each element that I've figured out in the price code to give you an idea of where you need to go with things. Now, as I said, I've only done this on four treasures. The first two, I figured out the price code by connecting the dots between the two, then I used the dots that I'd already connected and the price code to connect the dots on two more treasures. So all in all, four treasures using the price code. And then I've even gone a step further and I've confirmed the same things, the same elements and the two casts that have already been found in Cleveland and in Chicago. So it seems to be that it is a reoccurring theme uh, and a reoccurring element in all of these puzzles that I've looked at so far. I haven't looked at the other ones, like I said, disclaimer, um, but these things are consistent. So if they're consistent for these six treasures and all that I've looked at, then it's probably consistent through the rest. Again, do your research, do what you have to do, and hopefully we can all come together and find a cast. Now, once you put all the clues together and you figure out your location of the cask, there's supposed to be an eight by eight plexiglass box that holds the ceramic cask, which holds a key. That key is supposed to open up a safe deposit box that has a precious gem in it, the same gem that's pictured in your painting. So if you're looking at the St. Augustine one, it's gonna be the sapphire. If you're looking at the Charleston treasure, it's gonna be the diamond. If you're looking at Roanoke Island, it's gonna be the garnet. The gemstones, 
that are in the paintings are the ones that you would be recovering if you found the key and sent in the cask and key to the publishing company because apparently they're still honoring this and apparently the jewels are still available. That's not like solid. It's what people have said on Facebook and the wiki and everything else. So, you know, just know that I'm only saying it because I've seen it on there. It's hearsay and you would have to confirm for yourself if you found and recovered a cask. Now, collectively, all 12 jewels back in the 1980s, in the early 1980s, were supposed to be worth $10,000. Now that's collectively all 12 jewels, okay? But again, 36 years has passed since then and they're probably worth a lot more. The treasure casks that they are kept in, that the key is kept in, that should be worth a lot of money too. They're rare. There's only 12 of them. Only two have been found and recovered. So we only have proof of those two casks. And so those are worth a lot of money. Okay, so first things first, um, my first instructions are to read the book. Now you will find in the first few chapters, as I said before, sorry, it might be drowning out the audio because it's raining. Great. Might have to re-record this later. We'll see. Read the book. The first few chapters has like the litany of the jewels. It has, you know, the departure and things like that. The premise of the book is that the fair people immigrated to North America to get away from man. And in doing that, when they came here, traveled to wherever they wanted to, that felt like home to them. But you have to pay attention to the tribes that they're associated with. You have to pay attention, attention to the local area or what it was previously called. You have to pay attention to all of that stuff to figure out exactly which one goes with which, okay? And it'll help you figure out clues that are in the paintings and the verses. Now, a lot of this also has to do with immigration. So you're going to find some major immigration ports, you know, close by or like very significant places like St. Augustine. Next thing is to read the verses. Now, there is a code to decoding the verses. Yes, I know they're like a foreign language. They're like hieroglyphics. They're, you know, I know they're hard. I get it. They're difficult. But there is a specific way to read them. And again, with those four that I've discovered and then the other two confirming it with the cast that have already been found between the six I've confirmed the setup of the verses in a specific way that will help you figure out exactly what you're looking at now the important thing to take away from the verse part is that some things are meant to be taken literally some things are meant to be taken figuratively now you've got to figure out which one it is that you're supposed to be doing for the specific Task that you're working on. Next thing is to look at the paintings. There are there's a lot of information in the paintings, and I will be going in that into that. That's going to be the majority of the episodes. Is going to be all about the paintings. There are things that specific things that you need to look for in each of these paintings. And again, it comes down to that price code that I was telling you about. It comes down to certain things that you need to look for, and you could take it from you know the top all the way down. And that's the order I'm going to do them in. I am not, just disclaimer here, I am not regular on my uploads. I still work a full-time job. I still have responsibilities. I have my YouTube channel to think about as far as our treasuring stuff. And then I have this kind of on the back burner while still trying to do a lot of other stuff. So I don't upload regularly. If you want to be notified whenever I do upload, hit the bell and it'll notify you when I upload something. Just be warned about the paintings. There are elements in there that are gonna get you to the general area of the cask. And then there's elements that's going to get you right to the cask. And what I mean by that is the elements that are the general area is gonna be the city. So if you say things that are kind of widespread and it's talking about a statue here and a statue there, or you're looking at, you know, something that's in there that re resembles something in a museum that's close by, that doesn't mean that it's the actual location of the cask. You have to find the actual location of the cask using specific elements in a specific way. And as I said, I'll talk about that on a future episode. So the main thing to take away from that is make sure you're looking at the right things and that you're looking at things that will take you to the cask, not just general elements in the area, okay? Because otherwise you're just gonna be chasing your tail. That's it for this introductory episode. So it was basically just to tell you about the secret if you didn't already know, but a lot of you probably already do know a little bit or a lot about it because people have been searching for this for years. Just make sure that you're looking at things the right way.
stay tuned for the next episode. Like I said, I'm not regular on upload, so I'm sorry in advance, but if you liked this video, please give me a thumbs up. And if you would like to see more in the future, you can subscribe. And like I said, if you want to be notified when I upload something, just hit the bell and it'll let you know when I upload. So I will see you next time.